There was a contest some time ago, a contest of two men trying to win a prize and to win the prize in their painting, they needed to paint the best description or the best portrait of peace. And while they were painting, one man painted this tranquil Saturday morning, Brady Bunch setting, if you will, cartoon watching setting where there was no chores that needed to be done and the sun was shining like it is today, but a, with a little warmer temperature. And so he painted his version and then the other man painted a version, and when he painted the version, he painted a storm with thunder and lightning and clouds billowing over rough seas, uh, kind of like the waters you would see if you've ever watched Deadliest Catch, uh, waters of the Bering Sea, uh, the storm season, a time where you wouldn't want to be on the water. But lo and behold, in the right lower corner of the portrait, there was a lighthouse being beaten and battered by the waves and on the lighthouse perched was a bird singing. The bird was singing. And wouldn't you know it, this artist is the one that won the contest for the best portrait of peace. Because that is peace, because peace is not the removal, is not the preventing of a storm. Peace is the calm that persists throughout the storm. Yes. Peace is what covers and keeps you and overcomes the consternation that tries to destroy you because of your situations and your circumstances. Mm. Oftentimes, the challenge for us to really walk in peace uh, with God is that we struggle with putting it in God's hand. It's almost like the man that was saying that he was going to let God have his way in his life. And he had knelt down to pray. And while he had prayed, he came up from the prayer saying, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't let God have his way in my life. And, and as he remembered that this is the man that had put, uh, like some of us do, he had put a model up on the wall the day before that said, let God. Because he was really trying to put it in God's hands. But as he came up feeling despair and like nothing had changed, he went out the room chanting, I can't let God have it, and slammed the door, only to come back in the door and to realize that as he slammed the door, one of the D on his let God had fell from the wall, and now the motto meant, said, let go. Okay. Let go, and, 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 and it, what it communicates to us a lot of times in order for us to let go and let God have it is we really have to let go and but we won't let go until something comes slamming or crashing in our lives my question on the table to you what is slamming or crashing in your lives what is it that you won't let go that is preventing you from hearing the theme that we're going to speak about today and that theme is receiving God's better peace what is it that you won't let go so you can receive God's better peace? Uh, see, worldly peace seeks people, places, and things, and satisfaction from situations. It's somewhat like a teeter-totter. It's, it's up one day, down tomorrow. There's nothing consistent about it. it because situations don't always remain the same. And so this is why God doesn't want us to have our peace in the people, places, and things. Not even in our family members per se, because just like yesterday, the man that God had called him home was a father figure to his daughter and to the rest of his family. Everybody showed up when he came to town. He was a source of joy and, and peace, so much so that his daughter, no matter what happened throughout her day, at the end of the day, she would always call him every night to share what it went wrong or went on in her life. She was in essence praying to him every day. Now that was a good thing because she understood that her daddy loved her and was going to do whatever he could to make things work right. However, just like you and I, uh, as Ecclesiastes says, there's been appointed a day for men to be born and appointed a day for men to die. And so what they faced an untimely reality was that all of us 
that are on this side, say Christ come back first, are going to be called home. And we, my or you, are not God's, are not their eternal peace. We're not the ones that are going to last through the by and by. So God says, I need you to get your mind on where your peace comes from, not from your resources, but from the source. God's peace is not situational or circumstantial. Solomon says it in Proverbs 3 and 5 and 6. He says, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge me in all your ways. And I will make your path straight. And now it's God and all, the Lord in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. But he says in between that, he says in the middle, lean not on your own understanding. That understanding carries the idea of someone leaning on themselves that would only fall the more they put weight or pressure or dependence on their ability. The more you try to keep yourself up, the more I try to keep myself up, the more I try to grow this church, the more I try to grow the business, the more I try to build my finances, the more I try to become a better husband, the more I try to become a better father, the more I try to make my health as best it can, the more I try to do whatever I can do in the community, the more I try to raise up my civic organizations, the more I do that outside of God's guiding and leading, it's not an if, it's a when that I'm going to fall. Because I'm leaning on my own understanding of peace. What if you made your peace? Maybe you don't know what your peace is. Because my dad says, let's define the terms. The word peace that's in this text is the Greek word arene, which comes from the Hebrew word shalom, I'm only using those languages to say that in the Hebrew, the idea was always a peace with God. Always peace with God. Peace with God, you ask? Peace being in simple form, harmony, wholeness, and well-being. Meaning that what is it in your life that gives you harmony, wholeness, and well-being? What are you pursuing to give you identity, what are you pursuing to give you self-worth? What are you pursuing to hold you up? What are you pursuing to state that your, your present life is good because of this, them, or they? What, what are you using for your future to say that everything will work well as long as I have this, that, or them? See, when we're talking about peace, worldly peace, the idea is God is challenging us to think about what is it that is in the way that won't last? What is your resource of peace that is replacing the source of peace? Mm. Getting to the text, our background, Paul, the Gospel Globe Trotter, is writing to a church that he founded, the church in Philippi. This is a retirement community uh, for Roman citizens, specifically for Roman satirian soldiers centurions that after they had done their service uh, for the gladiator, if you will, uh, after they had served uh, Maximus, Maximus Aure or, I mean Aurelius, uh, that, that after they've done that, 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 that they have went to retire in Philippi. And so the church is here, Philippians, and they're Jews and they are not citizens in this area. And so they're looking around and watching everybody have a good day while they don't have any rights or ability or connection to the joy that everybody else has experienced. Have you ever been in settings where it seemed like you're looking at everybody else around you have a good time and things are going well, but it seems like you're the only one that doesn't get to take part in the fun? Does it seem like you're the one that seems to have all of the situations going on, all the worry, all the work on your back while everybody else seems to be resting and you can't seem to figure out a way to get the rest that they seem to so easily come across or come by? Mm, this is where they're at. And so they're struggling because they're looking at people around them seeming to be entitled to something that they're restricted from. Uh, now, they serve the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And so the question on the table is, why is this God thing not working out? 
why, if I'm serving Jesus, you might ask, why does it seem like they're having more fun than I am? Why does it seem like they have more peace and more joy than I do? This is where they are. And, and to add insult to injury, not only were they watching the people seem to have more peace and more rest and more joy and more benefits, they were also being persecuted by the people that had what they didn't have. They were having it rubbed in their faces about what they didn't have and what they couldn't uh, accomplish or accumulate. They were being told, you're not a Roman citizen, so you can't go to this bathhouse, and you can't eat this food, and you can't participate at this celebration, and, and you can't bear this seal. And so Paul is writing to them to let them know, don't get wrapped up about what is trying to tear you apart. Uh, but not only that. Not only were they struggling with what was going on outside of them, the fact that they were restricted from the joy across the street and being um, taunted by the people down the street, they also were struggling with the fact that the pressure on the outside started to burst pipes on the inside. Have you had situations and circumstances in your life of what you watched on the outside? What you can't change on the outside and what the serenity prayer, serenity prayer hasn't showed you the difference for of what you can change and what you can change. And now it's transitioned or progressed from down the street and across the block to in your yard and in your house. And so now there's conflict in the midst of your family members, your siblings, your mate. Your parents, you've got these problems with your bills, with, with, with your health. You, you, you're facing it at work, and now you're facing it at home. They were arguing in the church as the beginning of chapter 4 says. Paul urges them to help these two sisters, Euodia and Sintuki, who have been fighting. These are people that were Christians that have been serving. And Paul is telling them, I need you to help them come together in the faith, as I paraphrase and summarize. Paul uses this as the platform as he moves forward about this, this struggle that's going on in God's house that's creating despair, but it's really the pressure of the pipes from, from the pressure outside bursting the pipes inside. Do you know that the temperature on the outside can burst the pipes on the inside? Do you know that it ain't just got to be hot on the outside? Sometimes it's the cold, rigid effect that you, uh, frigid effect you face on the outside that bursts the pipes on the inside. Come here for a second. Just a few weeks ago, we had some really low temperatures. We had some win uh, winter weather, advise weather advisories. And, and what happened in my apartment, I don't know about yours, but I went to wash our clothes and the cold water, nor the hot water, and the wash would come up, turn on. Now, I'm from the hood, so I wasn't shocked by that. Uh, and, and I knew what was going on. Uh, but the reality was what was going on the outside had caused the pipes in our inside to freeze. And sometimes the reason we're so cold on the inside of God's house is that we're dealing with the frigidness that's going on at our house. Uh, and so we brought the temperature of where we've come from and the experience and, and changed the atmosphere of where we are. And, and so much so that God is trying to tell this church through Paul that you can't let the cold weather atmosphere out there change the heat and the warmth of the water so the water, the living water won't flow to you. That has cleansed you through the blood of Christ Jesus. See, see, you come to church, you're meant to be washed in the blood and through the word of God to move out the blemishes so you can be presented to Christ as holy, without spot or wrinkle, someone that he can use. And Paul is telling them that what's happened is you've let the temperatures, because you didn't let the pipe drip, you didn't let the water keep dripping. There's somewhere where we didn't turn the water on in our houses, and so therefore the temperature outside has got on the inside and messed everything up on the inside. It's messed everything up in every room. You would think it would just be one sink. But when that stuff happens, doesn't it have a way of hitting every sink? It has a way of going from the sink to the tub or to the shower. See, see, what God is saying, Paul is saying that when you've sought peace 
out there in the world and you try to make relationships and things that you're getting, you try to make them the things that makes you whole, that gives you worth. What happens is, is that you've not turned on enough water to keep the stream flowing. And so therefore there's a domino effect and lo and behold, you don't want to pipe the burst because therefore the problem is now all is all over everything. So Paul tells them, leads them up to this peace as he gets to verse 5. He said, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Verse 4 and 5, always. He said, rejoice in the Lord, always. Again, I will say rejoice. He said, let your gentle spirit be known to all men, for the Lord is near. He's saying that their character, because of what they were facing on the outside, that the heat and the hot temperatures that they were facing on the outside, the persecuting pressure from the people outside, the accusation and the antagonizing experience from the outside had now permeated the inside. Meaning that they were being accused and facing bitter conversation on the outside. And so because of what they faced on the outside, they became bitter people on the inside. Uh, how are you communicating with the people that's on the inside with you? Uh, are you still speaking with love to them? Or, or the pressure from the outside caused you to be applying pressure on the inside? See, Paul is telling rejoice. That word rejoice means to really exclaim that rejoice. It means to, to proclaim it, to shout it out. So it's not this inside hidden joy that is uh, shared with a simple smile that covers up all the hell going on. He said, I, this rejoicing is not the courtesy smile you give on Sunday morning. It's not the blessed and highly favored cliche type of lie you expouse on a weekly basis. He said, rejoice. He said, celebrate. He said, Paul, celebrate what? You see all the hell I'm going through? You, you see all the stuff they're bringing my way? You, you see how one bill only opens up a door for another bill to be due? You seeing how my health is fading and, and how I'm worried and don't seem to have any peace. And so Paul says it this way. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. With the spirit of thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. See how I forgot that thanksgiving? That thanksgiving just changes things. It just changes things. I opened up the service yesterday with this mindset. I need to have them thank God. We need to be thankful. Yeah. I don't know. The hardest time to give God thanks is at a funeral. Yeah. Is to give glory when they're looking at someone they loved is gone and passed away. The biggest question is, what's God good about? He clearly didn't do the job because we're here. That's the temptation to think. But we didn't give God because he was gone. We gave God because, thanks to God, because we had time with him. This was a man that was born in 1952 and died in 2024. So, that I means he was, what, 70, about to be 72 years old? So, he had three score and 10 plus one, almost plus two if his birthday hadn't already came. So, he, my daddy said this yesterday to somebody a couple times. They said, I'm about to be 73. He said, I've got three score and 10 plus two, two years of blessing. He said, I've got two years more than what God was giving me. And so when we gave thanks to God, we gave thanks not for what we didn't have and not for what we wanted, but what we had and what we had had before. See, when you're going to give thanks to God and you're going to rejoice, it has to start off with remembering who God has been and what he's done. Gratitude to God starts off based on what do you have. Who has he been? And not just what you have so, so much on possessions, but the reality is who he's been. Because God has been the one that said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God has been the one that told Joshua that at a time when they had never owned land, while they just came out of the promised land, did 40 years on the backside of the wilderness because of disobedience, where they experienced not God's hand of blessing, but God's hand of wrath uh, and judgment, where God said... Uh, no man will stand before you. At a time where Joshua was least likely to believe that because they were in a desert that they had been in for 40 years and they had been like some of the Motown people, I believe it was Motown, but they had been going in circles. Yeah. Mm. 
they had been going in circles. So it was at least time to be grateful, but they understood God said that no man will stand before you for the remainder of your life. Maybe it's not a man that you need to thank God that's not going to stand before you. Maybe it's no one man. Maybe it's no situation. Maybe it's no circumstances that's going to have authority over you for the remainder of your life. And see, we want to rejoice and give God thanks for that. Why thanks? Because when you give God thanks, God says you'll take your mind off of the anxiety when he says don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. He said in everything. He said well, whatever you're going through, not for what you have, wherever you are in life on this journey, heaven bound. He said in everything. He said so when you give thanks, you take your mind off the anxiety. The anxiety, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. Anxious, anxiety carries the idea of being pulled two different directions all at the same time. In simple form for our vernacular, it just means you don't know whether you're coming or going. Have you ever felt like you didn't know where you was coming or going? See, he said, the way to get out of not knowing whether you're coming or going is to first remember that God that got you up. You got to remember that God woke you up this morning. Mm. You said, well, I didn't want to wake up because I looked at today what I seen yesterday. Uh, he said, no, because when God wakes you up, God is showing that I have the ability to make your tomorrow better than it was yesterday. Mm. If I don't wake you up, it don't get better. It knows, there's no chance of it getting better because it's already over with. That's right. mm. He said, you got to give thanks to God and why thanks? He said, because your thanks is the one that's supposed to surround or encompass, protect your prayer life. He said, when you go to God in prayer, you got to go to God with a spirit of gratitude. You ever talk to an ungrateful child, had an ungrateful child ask you for something? Had an ungrateful child come to you and not say please? I was in the store yesterday with my nephew who, who's here, baby Ty, and, and so I was getting some candy and everything, which is our kind of thing that we do when we're together. And so I let him get all these bags of candy, and we're standing there, and we're, we're in Speedway, if you've ever been to that Thornton's, and, 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 and the, 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 the cashier thing is way up here, and he's standing down there looking like Arnold from, um, from Different Strokes. Uh, you would have thought he was going to say, what you talking about, because it's Willis, because it was so high, but but he's down here and out of his mouth the lady gives the bag and he says thank you yeah. no first he says please can I have a bag a separate bag uh-huh. I'm looking at this dude like please can I have a separate bag yeah. and I'm watching that he understood enough to use his manners even when it didn't seem favorable. How did he know that she was going to hear him from way up there and he's way down here? Come here for a second. Your gratitude has the ability to come in from way down here to reach the God that's way up there and changing things all in the atmosphere. And see, right after he did that, I got his Christmas money and when we got in the car, I said, hey man, let me break you off. Because of his gratitude, he got more than what he was expecting for. See, he thought he was just getting the candy but not only no not knowing I had already went into the account to get some money to give to him his gratitude opened up a door for him to get more in 2024 Paul said you got to let your gratitude surround your prayers and your gratitude is not thanking God for the situation it's thanking God in spite of the situation it's thanking God when they've got on your last nerves it's thanking God that you still have a nerve for them to get on you, you, you got to thank God for who he is and why. Because what he's saying is if God is still there, he's letting you know that he will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't know if you know it or not. If you've ever been, I'm from the hood, I always say that. But if you've ever been jumped or chased or faced odds that was too much for you and you just happen to look around and you've seen some of the cats run, but you have a more gratitude for the one that stayed even though the odds still didn't look good. God said, I'm going to stay regardless of how the odds look. You got to thank God because he's still there with you. And he's not there with you like he's done something wrong. He's still there with you knowing all you don't done wrong. God, you still here. You still hear my cries. God, you still let me call on you. God, you still speak to me. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that you still speak to me. Knowing that I'm tore up from the floor, but ain't got no business being in your king's court. You got to let that gratitude for a God that will never leave you for nor forsake you be what you start your prayers off with. 
And then he says, don't just spend all your time thinking because the think is your progress to you talking to God about what's going on. Mm. You could talk to God. He said, your supplications, let your supplications be made known. He's telling you, Jesus, Paul is commanding them through the word of God, through the Holy Spirit, commanding them to go to God with it. Think about that. He said, in order for you to let go and let God, you got to be told to go to God. Means that if you ain't going, God said, get going. See, if you ain't going to God, get going to God. See, you, you have the right to voluntarily show up because you are a child of the king. But, but if you're not going, God's not going to leave it there. God's going to come and ask, why ain't you brought that to me? Yeah. And he said, when you go there, he said, now you talked in general conversation because that's what the word prayer means. That's yeah. general communication. Yeah. That's everything's okay communication. But he said, God is not a fair weather God. Then he moves to supplications. He said, God is a God that can handle you in your emotions, in the situation that's blowing your mind, but didn't blow his mind. The situation that caught you off guard, but didn't catch him off guard. He said, you can come and tell me supplications means your petitions, your pleas for mercy and what you need. Has you ever had anybody that tells you, make sure you tell me if you need something? A lot of our problems is we keep telling people we need help, we need this, we need rest, and they don't listen. They act like they don't even hear us. God's saying, I'm not them. I'm telling you that I know you need something, and I need you to come and get it from me and not from them, this or that, because they are resources. I am these sources. He said, you sitting over there mad about what they won't do and what you know that they know they should do. They see you struggling. They should already know they need to help out. And God said, you can't keep wasting your time with them. Matter of fact, the fact that you got your attention on what they won't do has caused you to miss, of coming, miss coming to the one that will do. See, sometimes the things that's agitating us, Satan's trick of the enemy is, is that he gets us focused on something. And so while we're focused on it, even though they're doing what we, what we say they're doing, we are agitated. And Satan keeps building up that agitation because the more you get agitated, the less you'll turn from it and turn to him. See, God said, you can't fix it. Yes, they are wrong. They shouldn't have did it. But don't you keep talking about it, talking to people that have put you on a pay you no mind list. You need to turn around and look up. So who are you looking at right now that Satan is using as a distraction? You keep pleading to them instead of taking your pleas to him. You keep pleading to them instead of taking your pleas to him. You keep telling them what they did wrong, how they should do it, how they need to change. And God is saying that ain't never going to work because it ain't never worked for you anyway. You keep on walking in your insanity because you're doing the same thing, expecting a different result. You keep complaining and your complaining doesn't create a new consequence or a new reality. So you're walking in your insanity. You calling them crazy, but they know you crazy because you keep arguing and fussing about the same thing and nothing changes. You ain't did nothing different. You keep getting mad about today, what you got mad about yesterday. You get mad about this week, what you got mad about last week. You got mad about this month, what you was mad about last month. You get mad this year about what you were mad last year. God said, come out of your insanity. You keep getting closer to them because you're arguing and going to them. You don't realize you're getting closer. You're building intimacy with agitation and irritation. The closer in proximity you get to them, the more you're going to them, you're sowing into a relationship of dysfunction. You're, every little step you take, you, you think, well, I'm just telling them, I'm going to get them right. No, you, Satan is walking you into that relationship to where the further you get in, the harder it is for you to get out. You don't even think that you're building a soul tie there. You don't think that you're building a bond there. And you say, well, I don't know why I can't stop complaining. Because you put too much work in in that relationship and you haven't worked on the one that will pull you out. He said, God's peace, his wholeness and his harmless and his well-being, it surpasses all understanding. It surpasses all understanding. That word surpasses means it's better than. It's better than. Surpasses carries the idea of going further. 
going further. Often you hear preachers say, this is better than all understanding, meaning that when you don't understand why you got peace. Well, some of that is there. Some of that is true. God's peace, you will have peace at times. Like, man, I don't even know why I'm okay with this. I don't know why I'm okay. They used to get on my nerves. I used to kick and fight and fuss, but now I'm okay with this. Some of that is there. But what he's pushing, if we just press a little bit further, what he's suggesting is, is that God's peace is better. This is where we get the better peace. It's better because it goes beyond what you can't understand or have no knowledge of. I mean, there are situations in life that will catch you totally off guard and you have no explanation for it, yeah. right? God's wholeness and his harmony and well-being is better than that. It goes beyond that situation. It covers it, right? But then on the other side, it goes beyond what you can explain. Because sometimes even being able to explain it don't change it. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes even you know what's happening leads you more to complaining than changing. Yeah. Yeah. And so he said that God's peace goes beyond that. He's got this whole thing covered. He said, look, I know some stuff don't happen. Man, I don't know why that happened. Why this happened now? Why they do this then? God's peace is suitable then. It's the answer then. He said, but even when you can't explain, do you know what they keep doing or what they won't do and you keep talking to them and they keep ignoring it? He said, God's peace is better then. Mm -hmm. Paul's in prison when he's writing them about peace. How can somebody from prison write you about peace? How can somebody from prison tell you about peace on the outside and they on the inside? Think about that. They looking at bars. Well, he was in a, in a hole, actually, probably most likely, and maybe chained to the wall. In all darkness, no lights, no IPL, no Duke energy. How could somebody that can't see around them and don't know who's coming to feed them, when they're going to get food, using the restroom in a hole or beside themselves, how could this person who's suffering, got feces all around them, no daylight ever, People come to visit them, talking to them through rocks. They might not even be able to see them. And they're chained, like you see tigers chained up at the zoo to a wall or elephants. And this person has been giving some writing utensils on stones or dictated to somebody and says, I want you to tell them because I've heard that they're letting the pressure on the outside burst the pipes on the inside. And I need them to understand that their peace is not on the changing outside. Their peace is on the changing inside from up above. This is how, come on, Paul, you, you locked up, bro. Hey, I don't even think you got uh, probation, parole. I don't think they're going to parole you. I think he's locked up without parole. I mean, he's, he's doing better than fair time. He's doing all of his time. All of it. There is no what, two for one. There's no two for one there. Two days for one day. There, there is not that. He's doing all that time, and Paul says, you know what? I ain't going to focus about how they wrongly convicted me for loving my Lord. What I am going to do is I'm going to tell them that, hey, this peace I got on the inside is the peace that you're supposed to have on the inside, even in your outside. My peace is changing what's going on here on the inside. And I know Paul says, I know if this peace will change me on the inside, going on in here, yeah, yeah. most certainly the peace will change what's going on on the outside right, right, with you. Right. And so it's better peace. He said, you got to let God know. You got to let God know what you're going through. You got to let God know what's happening if you're going to have peace. It's better peace. I got a little more, but we'll come back to it next week so we can honor the time of day. We'll, we'll do part two next week. But the reality is, is that we have to have a thankful spirit that the way we start with getting peace, it starts with our prayer life that's surrounded by thanksgiving in God for who he is. That that word God right there in the Greek is theos and it carries the idea of the creator of the universe. So this is why God, because he created the universe, can never be looked at as a resource. He has to be seen as the source. But he's not only the creator of the universe, he also is the sustainer of the universe. 
And so anytime something is sustained, something is sustained is harmony, wholeness, and well-being. Harmony, wholeness, and well-being. And so sometimes we miss out on it because we're too distracted. We're too distracted. And so God is trying to tell us, I'm trying to give you peace, but you'll come in in church and be solely distracted, and then you'll go right back home and miss everything that I was trying to give you to help you. And then you'll be looking at God like, God, why don't you help me? You'll be talking to God. God, why don't you come through? And God said, I was trying to help you while he was preaching, but you was too distracted. Yeah. You was too focused on something else. You was treating this like it was school. Mm. Like we sit in groups and we just, we just distracted. And then something comes slamming like the man slammed the door, something slamming in our lives. And then we don't understand why God doesn't speak in that prayer when you come talk to him. And you under, wonder why I'm looking across. They seem like they keep getting better, and they keep getting more blessed, and they keep having more peace. And God, it's simply because you was distracted. Because you was trying to find an escape. You was, you was taking anything that would cause you to laugh and smile so you wouldn't have to focus on me. And you was acting like tomorrow was promised. He said, the God of the universe that sustains everything. He is a king and he deserves all of our attention.